Hiya, and welcome back to Wayfinder, the game that teaches us that the best way to piss people off is to have a cliffhanger. I don't know. Um, that, that just seems like a good way. Anyways, but it's also like a great method for storytelling, I, I don't know. Anyways, let's just hop right in. The four of us stand on an empty path near the riverbank as I look off the side over the railing. Across the, ride, across the wide river, I can see a great many buildings, their lights adorning the dark night like stars. Alright, Finn, let's go over the details again. I want to make sure we've got them all straight. I sigh and turn to the three wolf giants to repeat myself once again. It started the night I met Arkin. Hiya. I had a dream where I woke up in a field and ran after the sun. I heard a voice calling to me, but it sounded faint, almost weak. After I met Geralt, I went to the library and fell asleep while studying, where in another dream I was in the body of a wolf chasing after the moon. Throughout that dream, I was being spoken to by the voice again. It was cryptic, but it seemed to want me to find something. Earlier today, I had an almost lucid dream wherein I was pulled through space away from the planet. I ended up in some place that felt and looked like the same place from the first two dreams. It was there that he introduced himself, Skull. I lean back against the railing and look at the three wolves in turn as I continue. He asked me to help him find Hati and free their father, and told me not to trust Acer. Not to trust the Acer. I told him I'd try to help him out. Do, do any of you know what the Acer is? How does it relate to this? The three wolf giants shuffled a bit, clearly at, at a loss for words and trying to come up with something. It's Bjorn who speaks up first. I can tell you that the Acer are beings of old that help guide the worlds on their true path. Your realm should have information on them, being one of their realms, or the realm of man, Midgard. Why Skull is telling you not to trust them, however, I can't say. I can't either. Hiya. Can't either, so I decided to move on. Well, how about these dreams? Are they typical of finders? Should I expect this more often? Not necessarily. Generally speaking, a finder's main powers are to sense intention, see people's true paths, and, see, and to see through glamour magic. It sounds like you're saying that you've crossed the divide, Finn. The fact that you, you can use magic to speak with us through your mind is one thing. However... Unless you're a magical prodigy, I think it's a safer assumption that this is, indeed, Skull talking to and he pulled you through the divide and sent you back. You were asleep, after all. But it shouldn't have been all in the course of a nap. That's what I can't figure out. Nobody can travel that fast as far as we know. Alright, let's say that this is all happening and Skull needs my help finding Hati and freeing their father. Where do I start? I don't really know much about Hati or whoever Wolf Dad is. A history lesson, then. Skull and his brother Hati are the great wolves from whom the three of our bloodlines hail. Skull has two separate bloodlines and Hati has a single lineage. The families generally work the same way. Two siblings, with the older one being able to have children to carry on the legacy, while the younger one is allowed to mate, but must be made infertile magically. Magically. But, wait. Then how are there two skull lines? Somewhere along the way, the skull line split in two. One of the brothers, Arkin's ancestor, decided to run away from home and mate for love. He was ostracized and disowned from the Great Chief's family at the time. And since he was no longer of the main skull line, his descendants had no claim to the seat. However, with the establishment of the Council of Elders, all wolf giant villages have been given an equal opportunity to establish candidates to become the great chief. Arkin, if I'm correct, is the first candidate of that side of the skull line to reach the stage. I look to Arkin. He's looking off to the side in embarrassment. His ancestors being the topic of conversation must not be easy. Is there going to be another conversation between you and Drax, Amethyst, that I will be laughing my ass off later, too? That's pretty romantic. 
Arkin's ancestor running from duty and tradition for love and freedom. I mean, but what does that have to do with Skull and Hati themselves? How does it all fit together? He was blamed for it. What do you mean, Arkin? What was your ancestor blamed for? Arkin looks into my eyes with sorrow and sighs. As I was growing, my mother would tell me this story every now and again. She wanted me to remember what my ancestor did, why he did it, so that I would never hate him for it. The great wolf made his children Skull and Hati lead the wolves from the Iron Wood. Our lineage was tasked with protecting every village and expanding the Iron Wood. Those were the only tasks left to us. He knew the traditions were enforced upon our families by their own ideals and not born of the will of our progenitors. Hold on. Protect the villages from what exactly? The three wolf giants looked to one another for an answer to my question, but none of them seemed to have an answer. A good question, Finder. You're lining things up nicely. I hear the voice, but nobody else seems to. See, that's the fun thing. I, I feel like... Okay, 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 okay. Right now I'm trying to figure out which of these is Skull and which one is Hati. Because, like, Arkin over here is just is just love. He's just love. He's just love. It definitely didn't sound like Skull. Then who was it? I open my mouth to mention it when Arkin picks back up again. My ancestor and his brother grew up with their friend, a woven lass from their village. Over time, both brothers began to love her. One day, my ancestor's brother was named Great Chief, and my brother was prohibited from having offspring. The Great Chief attempted to claim the girl the two brothers had known their whole lives as his mate. Although she did not love him, she was forced to accept his offer of courtship by her parents. However, in secret, the girl loved my ancestor. The two planned to escape. Although my ancestor was forced magically to be made infertile, his mate was already bearing pups, and so they ran away together to live happy lives. That's how the Vessel line was formed. That is not how my people would tell it, though it bears more truth than the versions of the tale I have heard simply by the merit of its storyteller. I do not trust my family to tell a version of events unmarred by some lie here or there to save face. Arkin, it cannot have been an easy path, and I apologize for the harm my lineage has done to you and yours. Arkin smiles softly at Geralt and nods. I thank you, friend. You are much unlike your family, and I'm grateful for that. Geralt smiles as well. So, what about the other lines of Skull and Hati? Arkin chuckles and appeases my curiosity. Well, Geralt's line is called the Spear Line as they are the legitimate, direct lineage of Skull. It's a straightforward lineage, so to speak. Bjorn's line is called the Bear Line, a more recent name. So, why is Bjorn's called the Bear Line? Bjorn seems to tense up again. The elders from a time between then and now gave our lines these names to more easily discuss us. But since we recently took back the role of Great Chief, the elders likened the period out of power to a hibernation. Hence, bears. Cute! I nod in understanding, hiding my delight as at the nickname's fittingness for Bjorn's stature. When Bjorn finishes his explanation, I decide to pull the topic away from the talk of names and back to Arkin's family history. Arkin, what exactly happened after your ancestors left? Why were they ostracized so harshly? I get that he stole the bride or whatever, but that can't be it, can it? Was Geralt's ancestor really that vengeful? You said he was blamed for something. Was... was it that? Shortly after all this happened, Skull and Hati convened somewhere in the Ironwood. Their last sad howls were heard together by everyone. Nobody nobody saw them again after that. My ancestor. He was blamed for Skull and Hati disappearing. They said he broke the traditions of the Ironwood and that Skull and Hati chose to leave us because of his actions. The young of my lineage have always been called things like vessels of evil by other children growing up. We generally don't have to deal with that in our village, but outside of it, others can be cruel. Oh, Arkin. Poor guy. My ancestors have eased up on ostracizing Arkin's line through the, through the years, though mostly they simply have done so because they feel it is beneath them. I myself feel the entire thing is petty on our end. More than that, nobody should be blamed for happenstance, and it would appear I was right. From the sounds of it, I would say Skull and Hati have been enslaved or captured by the Acer. That may explain their ex 
their anguished howl so long ago. I prod him with my elbow. Weren't you just saying yesterday something about hoping that Vessel Wolf failed out before the trial? Geralt suddenly looks embarrassed and laughs nervously as Arkin studies his face. If I am honest, that was not an insult. Arkin is known to my family as a pretty active and diligent person. Even I hear tales of his deeds and to help his village from my tower. I was hoping I would not have the competition. Arkin laughs at this and pats Geralt on the back. Still, if your theory holds any water, I think we should look into these Acer. If they have captured Skull and Hati for some reason, we need to figure it out and free them. Maybe doing so will help us determine which of you should be the great chief. Well, you still only have half of the story there. Back to Skull and Hati themselves. The two were known to bicker about what they wanted to focus on for the Iron Wood. Hati wanted to expand outside the Iron Wood, while Skull wanted to keep the Iron Wood contained within itself to protect every village. Ideally, the Great Chief would focus on both of these desires. Geralt scoffs and glares daggers at Bjorn. He also drops the formal charade, and I can tell he's getting pretty upset. That's rich. Hey, Arkin, does your village feel very protected to you? There didn't seem to be much help from the Great Chief after the Blight, did there? Arkin looks taken aback and then goes quiet as a somber look overtakes him. What is Geralt getting at? I know things aren't so great everywhere, but when I'm Great Chief, I intend to pull the wolves back from the expedition to protect the villages. Protect the villages using funds properly and ensuring- Geralt cuts him off after hearing just a few seconds, clearly not intending to listen to Bjorn as his anger seems to have a hold on him. Bjorn is stunned in silence. When you become the great chief, it's because of two generations of haughty wolves up holding one of our traditional ideals and ignoring the other that all of the healthy and able wolf giants were sent off to distant corners of the world. Meanwhile, the old, sick, and young fended for themselves. I don't intend to let some pillow-sniffing over wealthy ass take the position of great chief. Bjorn looks in shock looking perplexed by what Geralt has just said. I want to jump in and defuse the situation, but I'm not exactly equipped well enough to dispute anything. And? What exactly are you doing to help? As far as I've heard, you're tucked away nice and safely in your tower waiting for your prince to save you. The argument between them continues on as I'm forced to watch them bicker back and forth. An insult here, a near threat there. Am I in over my head here? Hey yo! Just... Wow! Just... Wow! Am I in over my head here? Can I really help these wolf giants? Arkin is just smiling. I find it hilarious. Like, like Arkin, Arkin is over here just like, ha ha. Geralt is like, Geralt is like, ah, you want to f square up, big boy? And, well, no, Geralt is like that. And Bjorn is over here like, fuck around, find out, bitch. I find it hilarious. Like, Arkin is just over here enjoying it. He's just having the time of his life. Well, the text doesn't match up, but the sprite. Like, if, if we just if we just go by the sprites. If we just go by the sprites. Arkin's having the time of his life. Geralt is planning to square up. And Bjorn is looking like he's about to murder someone. Looking like he's about to send someone to Jesus. Same day shipping. And it's probably going to be Mr. Twink here. Arkin's arm wraps around my shoulder and I look up to see his worried gaze. 
Will you both please settle down? This isn't the time for- You ought to be happy someone's standing up to these haughty bastards for you, Arkin. If it goes on much longer, you'll hardly have a village to protect at all. <laughs> Bjorn stops himself from saying what he was about to say and looks at Arkin in surprise. But what does he mean, Arkin? Vill villages like Arkin's were left to rot because they weren't any healthy there weren't any healthy or able-bodied adults to join the expedition in the first place and your thrice damned uncle was only sending recovery to villages that could offer at least a few Arkin looks away and I reach up to comfort him poor guy I'm the only wolf from my village who was picked as a candidate all the other wolves are much too old or have children to care for most of our sick have already he doesn't need to finish the sentence. I run my hand up his shoulder and pat his back. What a miserable thing to know. To have to live with, knowing you can help and feel feeling hesitant to, still after hearing this. If I can help these wolf giants in any way, shouldn't I? Why am I so scared and hesitant to try? Is it because I think I'll fail? Can I really make things much worse than they are? Geralt joins me in comforting Arkin and stares daggers at Bjorn again. We'll have to stick together, friend. As skull wolves. Haughty wolves just can't change. Wow. Wow. You know, Geralt, that was, that was very racist of you. I think he's being racist. Is Geralt being racist? I'm I'm pretty sure Geralt is being racist right now. Wait, would it be wolfist? Lineage based prejudice. Lineage based prejudice. Okay, uh Lineage-based prejudice. Okay, 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 okay. I think I found- I think I found something. I found something that might be what I'm looking for right now. Hiya, and thank you. Okay, 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 okay. What is it called? Okay. Wait, this is just a story. Lineage-based prejudice term. Okay, okay. So, types of bias. Control F. Okay, uh, let's just go through the types of bias. Iphobia, classism, discrimination. It's, it's at least discrimination. It's not a hate crime, I think. Implicit bias. That's it, that's it. Implicit bias. Maybe. Occurs when someone consciously rejects stereotypes and supports anti-discrimination. No, that's not it. Okay. In-group bias. The tendency for groups to favor themselves by rewarding group members economically, socially, psychologically, and emotionally in order to uplift one group over another. That's exactly what it is. Thank you, Wayfinder Levon. Thank you. M much appreciated. V very pog. Just a round of applause. Thank you for pointing it out. Th round of applause. Just r round of applause. That's, that's very pog. 
Okay. You know, Geralt, that is very in-group bias of you. Bjorn's ears fall back and he walks away, but not before giving Arkin one last look. That look in his eyes. It's one I know well. The look of guilt. Not like being caught red-handed, but more like self-blame. The look of a man who is powerless to stop the worst of all things, but still hopes he can. Help. Hope which is shattered when it is not enough. It's one I've worn many times. But right now, it's one I needed to see to spur me into action. I'm still holding on to Arkin's hand, trying to soothe him. To ease him out of his distress. He looks so miserable, no doubt thinking about his village. I let go of his hand and pat his shoulder. I turn to Geralt angrily. What the hell is your problem? Geralt looks toward me in shock as I blow up at him. I can feel Arkin tense up next to me as well. He's a haughty wolf. He, he starts to speak, but I cut him off. Quiet! Shut! Cut that bloodline shit out! Regardless of how his people has acted, and regardless of how they have led the people, Bjorn is his own person, and he wants to help people! Girl stumbles over his words, looking to the side and holding his muzzle to self-soothe. As if you would know. You just met him yesterday. I have known much about these wolves my whole life. I walk up to him and look him in the eye. Don't... Give me that shit! I can feel his good intentions as plainly as I can feel how sorry you already feel about what you said. It's partially true. Girl size betrayed him before my finder ability could. I put my hand on his shoulder. I think you need to apologize. Maybe not now. He probably doesn't want to see you. Just do it soon. With that, I motion for Arkin to follow me with a head tilt and we walk past Girl together, heading after Bjorn. Not gonna lie, I thought that said Flynn for a second. <laughs> no, 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 I, I don't, I don't need to make that. 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 Okay. Arkin and I find Bjorn almost a full block away, leaning forward on the rail overlooking the river. He's resting his chin in his paw hands. I move into his field of vision slowly, but clear my throat to not startle him. Bjorn, buddy. You okay? He sighs and looks toward me, his expression a bit sad. Y yes, I'll be fine. Just a little stung and... Honestly, the alcohol I had earlier didn't do as much to ease my nerves as I'd like. I place a hand on his shoulder to comfort him. Must be a heavyweight, huh? I'd love to drink with you sometime. Been hankering for some mead. Well, why didn't you order some at the pub? We ordered beer, but they had mead and ale too. Arkin laughs and pats my shoulder. I wanted you to be able to keep up, love. I scoff, blushing at his very pointed innuendo. I can keep up just fine, mister! Fuck, that was awful. I can keep up just fine, mister! Well, I'm not much for mead. I prefer spirits myself, but I'd love to drink with you sometime, Arkin. You should come with us, Finn. I smile. Bjorn's spirits seem to be lifted. But I daren't say much, lest I start an all-out pun war. Oh, oh! Fuck! Fuck, that was a pun! Shit! Well, the night is still young. We can just go tonight. Well, I actually know a place. It's not too late for me to call it. I can get us a private room. We hear footsteps approaching, and I turn to see Geralt meandering toward us slowly. He approaches Bjorn, who cautiously addresses a silver-furred wolf. Uh, oh, you're here. What is it now? 
Geralt shuffles anxiously, and I can see his tail pointing straight down. Bjorn, I came to apologize. I'm so deeply sorry for what I said about you, and while I may not hold your family in the highest regard, I understand that I shouldn't judge your character based on their actions. I should get to know you, and I would like to. If you'll give me the chance. I realize Geralt's eased up on the formal speech and has let himself appear vulnerable to Bjorn. The bespectacled, the bespectacled wolf seems to ponder Geralt's apology for a moment, then smiles. Well, I won't say I can blame you. Or anyone, for that matter. I agree that what my family has done is all but noble. Please, Geralt, if you learn anything about me, it's this. I only wish to make a better future for our people. If I don't end up leading our people, I'll do my damnedest to help whoever does. Geralt nods and smiles. I can agree to that. If either of you become great chief, I'd still do everything in my power to help you out. I don't know. We all want a better future. I shouldn't treat this as a competition. Regardless of who ends up leading the Ironwood, we three have been brought together to find Finn for that very same goal. Bjorn moves away from the railing and hugs Geralt tightly, which throws me off. You look so warm. Arkin laughs and approaches them from the side opposite me. Aw, oh, you two are gonna make me cry. Come here! He puts his arms around both of them, and the three wolf giants hug one another. I want to join, but I'm certain the bones in my body have a weight limit. I resign myself to just smiling and patting their shoulders while standing next to the furry mountain. We will be like one big happy family in no time! Seeing these three like this, I can't help but to think about which of them will ultimately become the great chief. More than that, my mind is brought back to Skull and Hati. I don't know much about them at all, and my wolves don't seem to have much to go on either. Who is their father? Another good question, Finder. However, there is another question, not unlike that one, that you must find the answer to. I feel my stomach drop. That voice again. It definitely isn't Skulls. It's sinister. A bit scary and definitely darker. However... I get a strange feeling as I think on its words for a second and realize there's a piece of the puzzle I don't have that may help me find some other some of the other pieces. Top three and cute squad. Um, uh, fuck. Oh, uh, shit. Okay, okay, um, um, I'm, I'm gonna have to think on this. Okay, okay, um. Hang on. Yeah, I'm, I'm using brain. Hmm. Hmm. Number three, Apollo from No More Future. Number two, TJ Hess from Echo. And number one, June Kobayashi from Tennis Ace. I fucking love June. A question I must find the answer to, similar to my former question? That seems too obvious. And yet it's genius. <laughs> Tigers! Ah! Who was their mother? Chapter 6, Passing. I hold my hand over my eyes to block the sun from view. It's already bright enough for an autumn day, but I think I really had a lot to drink last night. Maybe too much. I had to force myself out of bed this morning force myself to face today. My head is pounding. My nerves are shot. My heart is racing, but still, I forge ahead, not knowing what to expect. 
and not knowing how to prepare. No, knowing nothing of what the day brings, except for grief and discomfort. And so, instead of pulling the covers back over my head, I pulled them off. I woke up, I got dressed, I took the train here first thing. The fear of the unknown isn't even the worst part of today. The worst part of today is the part that I've grown used to over the last eight years. But I focus on the unknown to calm myself. Will I really go with these wolves? Such a thing scares me and fills me with anxiety, and yet... I'm still contemplating this and realizing how little I freshened up when I reached my mother's door and knock. It only takes her several seconds to open the door and she smiles, moving closer and hugging me tight. She's going to crush the flowers. Oh, Finn, you made it. Hey, Mom. Careful with the flowers. She laughs and pulls away. looking me over slightly pressed flowers and all after a moment she motions for me to enter my childhood home as we enter the living room i can't help but look around searching for any evidence of hastily hidden glasses of wine or bottles of the stuff for that matter noticing none i turn to my mom impressed no alcohol you're sober today of all days i said june she smiles and nods excitedly I wanted to surprise you. I decided it was time to finally turn over a new leaf. I realized when I called you yesterday that I need to be more aware of what I'm doing to distress and cope with things. I threw it all away. I haven't had a drop since. Don't worry about it. Ah! I look at her in awe, smiling. Damn! She's got me beat by half a day. Wow, Mom, I'm seriously proud of you. I'm going to forget about that. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to forget all that. I'm sure Dad is, too. Thank you, Finn. That means a lot to me. We smile at one another warmly and I change the subject. So, are you ready to go yet? My mom tilts her head toward an embroidered blanket she looks as if she's working on, pursing her lips as if to indicate she's not willing to answer. I take the hint. Well, you finish what you need to. Mind if I wash up? I didn't get a chance to shower. Go on ahead, sweetie. You know where the towels are. I do. I head up the stairs to the bathroom. Entering the bathroom, I close the door. Slumping against it with a sigh. It's tough to see her like that, pretending things are alright. But am I really doing anything different? I woke up knowing today would be tough for me. I can only imagine how it is for her. Still, I hope everything goes well. So that I'm in a good so that I'm in a good headspace tonight. If I'm going with the wolves, I want to make that decision at full capacity. I start the water in the shower and let it get hot, then turn the temperature down just a bit. After spending some time soaking myself under the water, I decide I should use some nice smelling on my skin in a good shampoo and conditioner to round it out. To round it off. Which one? This is... I have a feeling that this is the most important decision we will ever make. This is the most important decision we will ever make. I start to rinse through my hair and run my hands through it. Looking over to the shower caddy, I reach for a bottle of citrus and hibiscus shampoo and begin to pour a healthy dollop into my head. Closing the bottle, I set to work applying it to my hair and working it into a lather. After about a minute of exfoliating and scrubbing, I start to rinse it out. I work on my hair for another few minutes, taking care to also treat it with a hibiscus honey conditioner. I decide to use a bar of lavender soap to wash my body with, and after a few minutes scrubbing and doing another round, I rinse off completely. I set the water to be a bit cool, and then, after finishing, 
I grab my towel off of the bar next to the shower and step out to dry off. Um, that's Chord Progressions. Chord Progressions is a, uh, me starring Sam thing. And I don't know when we're going to be doing another one, especially since school let out and I won't see them for another couple months. So, yeah. Finishing my shower, I decide to spruce up in the mirror. It's surprisingly unclouded by condensation, likely because of the mirror heating pad my mom was raving about to me on the phone sometime last week. A Bessomorph or the tech... Ah. After I'm done, I get dressed once more and head downstairs. When I'm down the stairs, I turn to my mother. Woohoo! Smiling and presenting myself. She laughs and claps for me. Oh, there's my handsome son. I don't know who that tired, world-weary man was earlier, but he's gone now. I laugh and wave off the comment. You all finished? My mom nods and holds up the beautiful embroidered blanket she has been working on. Yes, all finished. See? I smile and hold a thumb up. It looks like it was made by a master of her craft as usual. Dad will love it. I know it. We ready to go? My mom nods and gives me a chuckle. Of course. It's not like we need to wait any longer. Your father is already there, after all. I can't help but snort, even though it's a pretty morbid joke. It's exactly the kind of bad joke he would have made. We arrive at the opened gates of the graveyard together, arm in arm, with my other arm carefully holding the bouquet of flowers we just picked up from the florist. Oh! Oh! I thought he was in the hospital. I... I genuinely thought that he was in the hospital. My mother is carrying the embroidered blanket over her other arm held against her waist with an envelope in her hand. As we cross, as we cross the threshold, I feel a strange feeling washing over me. Some sadness that I know isn't the sadness I brought with me. My mom speaks to me. Are you alright? You stopped. Y yeah, I just wanted to check on you. Do you need anything before we go on? She ponders for a moment, as if she is debating saying something, but shakes her head. No, I'll be okay. We should get going, before the graveyard fills up with people. There's supposed to be a funeral today. That's odd, but not entirely unheard of, I suppose. Won't that interrupt service? The church attached to this graveyard doesn't hold regular mass anymore. You're likely holding, holding the funeral mass here, though. I don't see any cars... We shouldn't be over long anyway. I nod and we continue on. Moments later, my mom stops me. Finn, thank you for being here. I know you're trying to move on with your life, but it means a lot to me that you can be here for me in spite of your own feelings. I sigh. It's not like I don't want to be here, though it's definitely going to take its toll. I'll be alright, though. Let's go on. We walk on toward my father's grave. The trail winds around the edge of the graveyard and under many trees. It would be hard to tell where to stop walking and turn into a row. We've walked this path many times before. The two of us say nothing as we walk on. I look at the names on the gravestones aligning the dirt path as we pass. The ones that haven't faded are starting to look familiar after all the times I've been here before. My mom is humming a song next to me. It's a song my father used to sing all the time. I smile and start to sing the song, and my mom smiles and hums along. As I'm singing, I feel the same sadness I felt at the entrance, further amplified by our direct proximity to the graves, no doubt. Hiya. I wonder if it's something finder-y. I imagine Bjorn telling me something cool, like it being residual grief left from the many people who have mourned here or something. However, now that I think about it, that makes a lot of sense and I laugh to myself. There isn't anyone around physically, but this side of the graveyard has the most graves after all. It's also less creepy than the alternative, which is that I'm sensing ghosts. I shudder. My mom stops us again, looking at me. Are you cold? You were just shaking. 
No, I just spooked myself. Was thinking about ghosts being real or something. She laughs and pats me on the shoulder. I point over to a row of graves. We're still on Arkin's route. That's the row, Mom. We're here, Dad. Oh, shit, there's a new poster. I saw that, but I was thinking, oh, I might have seen it, but, like, everyone's bringing it up, so I'm going to go look at it. Okay, okay, uh, one last night, the end. Oh, that is dope as fuck. Mom leans over Dad's grave and wraps the bl dark blue and violet embroidered blanket around his gravestone. She kneels and puts her hands together over the letter, holding all to her chest and closes her eyes in, pr closes her eyes in prayer. She starts to talk to my father's gravestone, but I'm not listening. I've got too many other things on my mind to focus. I've never been a religious person, but I suppose one wouldn't blame me for questioning things now after everything. I decide not to pray with her, however. I'm not going to have a finding God crisis just because I met a few wolf giants. Instead, I kneel down next to her and put the flowers against the gravestone. My mom continues to speak aloud. Your son is here too. He brought you flowers. Aren't they lovely? She's in tears, and I wrap an arm around her and pull her into a hug. How dangerous a thing is what the wolves want me to do. Will I die? When I die, is this what she's going to do at my grave? Will she even know what becomes of me? My mom spends the next hour alternating between crying into my shoulder and telling my dad's gravestone about as many things that happened in the last year as she can remember. After a while, she wipes her tears. Standing up, she pats me on the shoulder. We should get heading back soon, Finn. I look up at her and sigh. Can I get a few minutes alone first, Mom? She nods and walks down the path, heading back to the winding trail. I don't feel, here near feel her nearby, so I turn back towards my dad's grave. Hey, Dad. It's me. I hear nothing. Of course. Just the, cithuris just the cithurism of the greenery all around me. I feel my heart racing again. My breathing starts to shallow. Breathe in, slow. Hold it, good. Breathe out, slower. Dad, have you ever had to do something scary? So scary and unprecedented for anyone's age, let alone someone's young? I sit there, my heart swelling. I wonder how you made it through. If you did. I lower my gaze to the ground. My breathing is shallowing again. Sitting down, I wrap my knees up against my chest. Dad, I've been so stuck in the past. And the things I've been through. I'm almost too scared to move on to this new part of my life. Breathe in, slow. Picking a major, dating guys, meeting these wolf giants. Breathe out, slower. All of it is just... Breathe in, but it hitches. Breathe out, try again. Breathe in, nice and deep, but it hitches again. I feel the tears welling up now and dip my head into my knees against my arms. Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm the reason you... I don't want to say it. I wish I could forget it, but I killed you. I can't move past it. I can't forget it. I can never forget it. I sit for a moment, feeling the late autumn wind at my back. I think about what I've done, what I've been through, what I've avoided because of my own hesitancy to move on. Dad, do you think... Is it okay for me to move on? Am I allowed to try to be happy now? Do you think I can let myself find some happiness? Breathe in. Hitch. The air around me is filled with more grief and sorrow. 
as though all of the past mourners are a tidal wave gathering and washing over me to swallow me up. My shallow breathing is set to overtake me. I touch my father's gravestone to anchor myself. Maybe I'll just hold myself back for another year, knowing that I'm the one hesitating to let myself be happy but still too scared to do anything about it. Breathe out. Try again. Then I feel a warmth at my back, like the apricity from above cascading up over me, holding me in its embrace. I smile. I breathe in, long and deep. Then I laugh, and I cry. Maybe it's only now, after I'm forced into something new, that I can finally move on. I wonder, what will I find ahead of me if I go with these wolves to their world? I wait a moment, wondering what he'd say to me. There's no way of knowing now, I suppose. Goodbye, Dad. I love you. And I miss you. I hope that next time I can bring someone I love, and who loves me, here with us. I rise, touching the gravestone one more time, and travel back down to the, down the path to the trail where I, gave, where I give my mother another hug. Dead. She doesn't ask any questions, and after a few moments we pull apart and get ready to leave together. Looking up to the sky, I see the blanket of clouds covering the world. The air around me gets a little warmer, and I feel safe. It's late afternoon by the time I make it off the train back in the city. I don't get off at my stop, but decide to walk home from the stop before it so that I can wander a bit. I need to get my mind off of everything for a while. I know I'm supposed to contact the wolves and make my decision, whether I'll be going with them and, if so, with whom I'll be going. I feel the pit of my stomach lurch. My anxiety is building. It isn't an easy decision, and I've put it off for longer than I intended but it's almost too much to handle today of all days. I should have decided sooner. I did this to myself, really. After wandering for about 10 minutes, I cut through an alley that bisects a city block. I don't need to make a decision right now, because they told me we'd just be putting in more legwork to meet the elders if we can't go now. I actually consider doing this, but it's just going to lead to me flaking on them time and again. Then what would happen? I'd have three sad, maybe angry wolf giants to contend with, and more than that, my life will probably just go on. Mundane and never boring. The anxiety swells up as I think back to my talk with my father's grave. I shake the thought off. I'm making such a mess of the whole thing. The sun is beginning to set. If I don't go tonight, I'll just wake up again in the morning and there will be another chance then. If I do that, though, I have class the day after tomorrow. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! The wolves told me they don't want to interrupt my life. They might not even let me go. I decided to just wander wherever my feet take me. I try to turn my mind off, but I can't help but think about them. About last night. We all ended up drinking together for over an hour after my wolves made up. They stayed together after I left for the night when I remembered I needed to get up early. I learned quite a bit about each of them last night, both while we were all drinking together and on the little date I had beforehand. Arkin's family forsook their lineage to be happy. Despite the shunning and constant harassment from higher class wolf giants, they still managed to become a pillar of support and hope for their village. Geralt spent much of his life locked away from everything by his parents. He blames the Hati wolves for the state of the wolf villages driving him to want to make change. Bjorn's family has been in control of the position of the Great Chief for two generations. He wants to reverse the hoarding of wealth and help the other villages as much as he can. As I wander, as I wander, my mind drifts from one wolf giant to the next and I find my anxiety waning as I think about him, the one I know my feet are bringing my body to, the one I will go to the other world with, Arkin. I can't help but think about Arkin again. He makes me feel safe. And I know I can open up to him if I just give myself a little push. I don't know how or when, but somewhere along my walk I knew I was heading for him. He's the person I want to be with right now. I wonder for a second if I'm just walking randomly and hoping for the best. Maybe I'm just hoping my finder abilities are working some magic. I decide to trust myself and turn off my resistance to it. Somehow, 
I just feel like I know where I'm going, so I decide not to interfere or change course. For all I know, Arkin told me his address and I just sorted subconsciously. I know this is untrue, but it keeps my mind off of my new apparent wolf tracker ability, so I just accept it. After a bit of a walk, I notice the sun starting to set. It's pretty late now, being early fall, so I figure I should find Arkin as soon as possible. I'm in a district near the one I live in, and I come upon a series of row homes. One of the homes in the middle of the street is practically pleading for me to come knock on its door, so I approach carefully. I walk up to the dark blue door and knock. Is this the right home? Will Arkin even want to see me? Why am I so anxious now? I feel my emotions welling up, fit to burst, and as the tears begin to fall from my eyes, the door swings open. I look into his jade eyes and he stares back in surprise. A tear drops from my eye, a whimper cries out from my mouth, and then a wolf giant is pulling me into a tight hug. Finn? Skull, preserve me. Are you alright? I can't say a word, despite trying. I just cling to him and cry. Let's get you inside. Come on, Finn. I'm pulled alongside Arkin as he brings me into his home and closes the door. <sighs> Emotional damage! Arkin and I stop in front of his love seat and he holds my arms as we lower ourselves down to sit. He pulls me in close and wraps his warm arms around me. There, there, Finn. It's alright now. I'm here. You can tell me what's going on, or if you need, I can just be here and hold you like this. I nod into his chest as I take a moment to collect myself. My arms are around his waist as he holds me tight. I take a deep breath to steady myself. I get a whiff of him, the scent of a meadow alongside the natural musk I've thought about since we met Grace's, since we met Grace's my nostrils. I let the scent overtake me and use it to relax myself. After a moment, I exhale. I finally feel like I can bring myself to speak. I'm sorry. I Am I being a bother? You don't need to be dealing with me right now, I'll just- Ah. He laughs heartily and I feel him run his fingers through my hair. It feels really nice. Oh, stop it, Finn. Honestly, I was getting pretty lonely, and I would love your company. He pulls me away a bit and looks me in the eye. So, wanna tell me what's gnawing at your ear? What's on your mind, Finn? I sigh and take another breath, then start. Today was my father's birthday. Arkin smiles at first, then I see the realization dawn on him as he considers the context. He pulls me close again and I feel his warm breath on my neck and he holds my chest against and he holds my head against his chest. After a few moments we pull apart and I continue. About eight years ago, my father and I were driving up the mountains for a weekend camping trip. I had my learner's permit, so I insisted that he let me practice driving for at least a few hours. I dropped my water bottle by my feet after I tried to put it in our cup holders under the radio and it fell off. I told my dad I was going to pull over to grab it, but he told me he'd get the bottle and unclasp his seatbelt to reach over and grab it. He picked it back up and put it in the cup holder between us where it couldn't fall through the bottom. We returned to just driving in silence. Arkin is listening to what I'm telling him with a bit of an anxious look on his face. I continue recounting the rest of the tale. So about ten minutes passed and we were driving around a mountain on a road right by a ravine. Some debris fell down in front of us and I... Well, I swerved off the road. We crashed into a tree. I was mostly unhurt, but my dad, he never put his seatbelt back on and... I don't have it in me to continue, but I don't need to. Arkin is already hugging me and patting my back as I cry. He whispers into my ear as he strokes my hair. I'm here, Finn. You're safe. I hold his shirt while I'm crying into his chest. His arms are around me now, and I know he's right. Arkin, I've been so afraid of living my life. For so long now, I felt that I didn't deserve to be the one to survive that accident, and it's taken almost eight years to finally try to do something for my future, for my own happiness. Finn... I'm sorry you had to go through such a horrible thing. 
Nobody should ever have to experience something like that. I know that days like this can bring about the pain you felt back then, but you don't have to handle those days alone. Not anymore. He's cradling me against him now, and it's warm. I nod. I wanted to believe that when I heard it from my mom and friends and family. I think now, after meeting the three of you, I'm starting to. I pull away and look him in the eyes. Arkin, I'm ready. Let's sleep together. His ears perk up and he looks at me in surprise. Finn! We shouldn't do that! I laugh and punch his arm lightly. Not that, you perv! I mean, I'm ready to go to your world. I'm ready to take those first steps toward doing something. He looks at me, his expression softening and his eyes studying me. Something that can help people and make me feel justified for having survived. Arkin grimaces and lifts me up suddenly, carrying me into his bedroom. Arkin lays me down on his bed. I instinctively kick my shoes off. He smiles warmly, locking eyes with me. Stay right there. I'm going to get the light. As he does, I pull my ankle socks off as well, balling them up and dropping them on the floor next to the bed. Arkin stands and moves toward the light, shutting it off. The room gets pretty dark instantly, and the only thing I can make out is his faint silhouette. That, and those luster screen eyes. I can't exactly make out what he's doing. As I start to sit up, I feel the bed shift, and his warmth hovers over me as I'm pushed back down. If lights were on, he'd see me blushing hard. Although, given he's a wolf giant, I assume he probably can. Arkin crawls atop me, holding my hands down next to my head. His green eyes shine in the little moonlight his curtains allow into the room. I feel his gaze locked on mine. I can't help but blush, but further blush after realizing our proximity as his breath warms my neck. He leans in and whispers gently into my ear. Finn. You smell absolutely incredible. I chuckle at his comment, and he pulls away as I smile while locking eyes with him. He knows how to disarm me. To be honest, Arkin, you do too. I can't get enough of it. Why is that? He leans back in and whispers once more. I need to tell you something very important, and I need you to listen carefully to my words. I nod and look into his glowing jade eyes. Finn. You are more, you're more than worthy to have survived. Your father dying was a tragedy, not a punishment. I gasp sharply as I feel hot tears welling up and spilling over suddenly. My breath hitches. His words hit something in me. Fuck. Arkin wipes my tears and leans to my left, cuddling up close to me, holding me. Finn, are you sure this is what you want? To fall asleep with me here and wake up in my world? I nod. I want to help you three, Arkin. I have to go through with this in order to do so. Aside from that, I hold my head against his chest and listen to his heartbeat. It's faster than I expected. Aside from that, I want to be here with you, right now, in the morning. And as long as I can be if you'll let me. Besides, it's not the first time I've fallen asleep in your arms. Is it? I haven't forgotten about the night you we met, you sneaky devil. He tenses up and I let out a laugh. He laughs, too. Eventually, I feel his heartbeat steady and I feel my own slow down until, moments later, I'm lulled into a deep sleep. End of Act 1. Intermission. One last photo. We're going to leave off here tonight. Ah! Ah! Arkin, you cheeky devil. Ah, anyways, stay safe, have a good night, and I will see you all tomorrow.